we are going to talk about the history of minimally invasive spine surgery or the newer version called a stitchless spine surgery under local anesthesia. I am Dr. Satish Chandra Gore from Pune in India and in the map of India my state is shown in yellow it is Maharashtra and I come from a place called Pune. Now I started this surgery around 1999 after I learnt it from the masters mainly from Dr. Anthony Young from US. If we go back in time, it was somewhere around 1933 and the date was September 30th, 1933 at the New England Surgical Society meeting where the work by William Jason Mixter and Joseph Barr was presented on the rupture of intervertebral disc with involvement of the spinal canal. In those days, of course, the work was more of transdural surgery because the approach was posterior midline which has still continued to be so, but it was transdural and now we of course go around the dural sac. Mixter was chief of neurosurgery at MGH and Barr was orthopedic surgeon to the outpatients at MGH. And this work actually set the ball rolling for different versions of surgery of the disc. There were surgeons who were doing the surgery of the disc, but this paper is supposed to be the main, main important dominating paper which correlated the pathology, the pathoanatomy and the suffering of the patient in the form of back pain and sciatica. And if we go through this paper, then we would find that it has been mentioned in the paper in the first paragraph itself that Schmall did a very painstaking, complete and authoritative work on Schmall's nodes, but this work was pathological and the clinician then needs to correlate with the clinical findings and apply it for the relief of those patients who are disabled by these lesions. The same still applies and it is true in our day-to-day -day work that we still need to correlate our symptoms with what the patient is talking with the images and the actual pathology which we see. This correlation of symptoms with the pathology has to be done very, very precisely. So we start with this paper on the rupture of the intervertebral disc with the involvement of the spinal canal from New England Surgical Society in 1933. Then of course the other paper which was extremely important which affected the development of spine surgery was in 1978 which was written by Kirkaldi Willis and this talked about pathology and pathogenesis of lumbar spondylosis and stenosis where he highlighted a series of changes or now it is famously called as a degenerative cascade which are progressive changes in the joints and the disc entrapping the nerves. Now mind you this is not a physiological study it is a study of cadavers and there is no talk of pain generation in this study and the series of changes which occur have been very well delineated in this degenerative casket. What we see on the left side are the posterior facet joints where the changes are in the form of synovial reaction, cartilage destruction, osteophyte formation, capsular laxity, subluxation, enlargement of the articular processes and the laminae. And on the right side we see the various changes in the intervertebral disc in the form of circumferential or radial annular tears giving rise to internal disruption loss of disc height, disc resorption and osteophytes at the back of the vertebral bodies. Now these two chains combine and can give rise to recurrent strains at the level above and below the original lesion giving rise to multi-level degenerative lesions and multi-level spinal stenosis. But the main things which we see in clinical practice are in the middle and the main main presentation has been circled with a pink circle that is disc herniation. Then of course some patients who come to us with instability of the functional spinal unit, then a lateral canal stenosis and a one level central stenosis where you may have changes in the front and changes at the back and then of course multi-level spinal stenosis can result. Mind you these are changes which have been described by study of cadavers and these have in no way describe the causation of pain or correlation of pain with the pathology which is seen. 
Now, what we do in our surgery and which we are going to highlight is we put a cannula which is paraspinal, intramuscular, retroperitoneal and in the intervertebral foramen as has been marked by the letter C over here and with a pink arrow towards the red target that is the posterior annulus and you will find that the axis A is a transperitoneal axis, axis B is a retroperitoneal or retrorenal axis, axis C is our axis, axis D is posterior midline axis and our axis is through the muscles that is the interspinalis, the multifidus, longissimus, iliocostalis and quadratus lumborum and then of course we have the transversus and we have the latissimus and those muscles but we are essentially retroperitoneal intramuscular paraspinal and transforaminal so that is the speciality of our axis and the same axis can be seen in this picture where the shaded area is the psoas major muscle and we come in the foramen from the paraspinal area now we are talking about the changes which have occurred over a period of time through three developmental stages. Number one, the basic surgery when it was intradiscal, then the moderate stage of development, whether it was transforaminal, the advanced stage of development where it is more foraminoplastic surgery, and there is a distinct trend toward minimalism, where minimalism is defined as tissue sparing and doing only what is necessary. Minimally invasive surgery in our definition is not surgery just by a small incision on the skin and the inside is same. We have uh, access to the pathology through the smallest possible surgical corridor and we are not cutting anything except the skin and the target tissue. The originators have different terms and different names which they have given to their techniques. Namely, Cambin used to call it as arthroscopic microdiscectomy. Schreiber and Loy used to call it as percutaneous nucleotomy under discoscopic control. Knight and Casper called it as endoscopic laser foraminoplasty. Ditsworth and Siebert called it as transforaminal endoscopic lumbar discectomy. Asher and Shoy called it as percutaneous laser disc decompression. Young called it as selective endoscopic discectomy and I call it as stitchless spine surgery under local anesthesia more as a platform rather than one single technique for treatment of the disc. Our platform includes treatment of the disc, it includes the treatment of the facet related back pain, it includes the treatment of the lumbar canal stenosis giving rise to claudication. Now the basic stage of development was to proceed intradiscally and do a central decompression that is the debulking of the disc. It was mainly directed toward a small size or a moderate size contained disc herniation and it was a blind method to decrease the intradiscal pressure. There was no scope in those days and in those days the etiopathology was thought to be pressure. So the surgery was essentially a decompression and 65 percent of the patient used to be relieved. Now this paradigm is something where whatever you do 65 percent of the patients feel better but mind you 35 percent of the patients are not better and therefore these things were not followed for long. It was percutaneous discectomy a blind fluoroscopically guided method used merely for intradiscal debulking to reduce the volume and the pressure of the disc the goal was mechanical decompression as the pain was thought to be only due to increased pressure inside the disc and around the root. And the work mainly about the pressure was done by Nakemson was published in 1978. It was a primary intradiscal approach as in the hands of Hijikata that is percutaneous manual discectomy. It was non-selective, not concurrent with surgical identification of the tissue 1977. A non specific depressurization with the use of laser by Asher in 1984 and a use of automated probe which was passed in the disc to deplate the disc without visualization of the target tissue by Gary Onik in 1985, where he came out with the automated percutaneous lumbar discectomy. 
the axis was more like 8 to 10 centimeters from the midline and it was at an angle of about 40 degrees which has now evolved into an axis which is about 12 centimeters from the midline at an angle of 20 degrees or 25 degrees. Now, developmental stage 2 was a moderate stage of development. It was to address moderate and large size of herniation and direct removal of herniated fragments was proposed. This was done under a 0 degree endoscopic working channel and it was either discoscopic with visualization of neural structures. So, we were slowly marching towards the real target and naturally the results improved from 65 percent towards higher percent of about 75 percent. And this was transforaminal as proposed by Matthews, Hall Matthews in 1996, Siebert endoscopic laser disc surgery the foraminal approach in 1996, Loy by Perkdinus foraminoscopy where he came out with a 0 degree scope which was then marketed by Carl Strauss as foraminoscope or under the label of endoforce. 1996 by David Casper as foraminal laser endoscopic disc ablation. It was posteriorly targeted decompression which evolved right from 1987, 1988 by Cambin, 1989 published by Michael Mayer, 1991 by Davis, 1992 by D as Perkdanus manual and endoscopic laser discectomy. An important event in 1995 was the publication of this work by David Schwarz and his senior Markovic about anatomical considerations in lumbar postrolateral percutaneous procedures where the foraminal safe zone was measured at each level thus validating the size of the scope and the size of the tubes which are put inside the foramen and this made the surgery extremely mathematical dependable. Then of course the background which changed the whole thinking about where is the pain coming from which was published primarily as tissue origin of low back pain and sciatica by Stephen Kuslich around the same time by Sizer as pain generators in the lumbar spine in 2001 by Hoey, Lozer and Calvin as mechanosensitivity of DRG as a pathological physiological basis for radicular pain of nerve root compression in 1977 commence in 2007 as role of sodium channels in nociception and sodium channels and mechanisms of neuropathic pain in 2006. So, slowly the understanding of pain, the understanding of pathology improved and then we came to the advanced stage of surgery where now moderate and large extruded and migrated herniations were our targets. We started visualizing the foraminal structures and the epidural space by widening of the foramen that is foraminoplasty and by ablation of the superior facet and the foraminal ligament. There was a direct decompression of the exiting and the traversing nerve roots with side firing laser and fine forceps. The thermal annuloplasty with bipolar radio frequency to treat discogenic low back pain and we can also now do canal stenosis decompression of ligamentum flammum in the upper part of the foramen. This is not interlaminar, but this is transforaminal. And we also have added the facet denervation as a modality of treatment for treating the facetogenic back pain. This foraminoplastic approach was proposed and popularized by Knight as endoscopic laser foraminoplasty, by Thomas Hoogland as percutaneous endoscopic discectomy, by Dr. Young as selective endoscopic discectomy by Sango Lee as percutaneous endoscopic lumbar discectomy and by John Chu by as micro decompressive percutaneous discectomy with laser thermodiscoplasty around 1996, 7, 8 and 9 and 1998 was the time when FDA approved the first working channel scope of 20 degrees which came under the label of Young's endoscopic spine system at that time. And then of course in foraminoplasty what we are doing is cutting the undersurface of the facet and we are de-roofing the foramen as to make space for the nerve root in a degenerated lumbar spine. Now there were various associations which also helped in propagation of these messages and in 1999 the American Academy of Minimally Invasive Spine Medicine and Surgery was formed in Las Vegas in Haraz Casino 
by Dr. Chu, Dr. Savage, and Dr. Young. And in 2002, myself and Dr. Lee formed the Asian Academy of Minimally Invasive Spine Surgery, where we are covering two thirds of the globe in population. Now, there were various instrumentations. We started right from Cambin to Loy, the YES system, the KES system, the EKL, the vertebris, mainly from Richard Wolf, the WSH, and now the Gore set from Carl Stoll. And the added modalities are as radio frequency and the laser, and many more modalities which are coming slowly started arriving on the scene for surgery of the disc. Now, this is my set which is proposed and which is useful in the management of degenerative lumbar spine. And the main highlight of these instruments now is the hook and the bendable instruments which help us in doing the surgery, what we call as surgery out of line of sight. What is minimalism is tissue preservation, that is we palpate and target the source of pain endoscopically during aware state. We improve the outcomes of discectomy and sequestrectomy root canal decompression and then peridural, perineural neurolysis, osteophyte removal, tumor ablation, feldback surgery syndrome and lumbar canal stenosis. Then we do only what is necessary. For example, in patients who have a chemical radiculitis, we do a selective nerve root block and thereby we minimize the harm to the muscles, to the ligaments, to the peridural structures and the neural structures. This is an important paper which came in 2004, which talked about the effects of nucleus pulposus on the nerve root and neural activity, mechanosensitivity, axonal morphology, and sodium channel expression. There, of course, have been multiple papers by Gel Olmarker on the effects of nucleus pulposus on the nerve root, on the dorsal root ganglion, chronic effects, acute effects, hyperacute effects, and then, of course, the advent of biologicals in the treatment of sciatic pain and back pain also arrived from the scene. We have started doing a facet innovation. This is the dorsal root on the transverse process and we then take care of this medial branch of the dorsal ramus as to denervate the joint and relieve the back pain. Now, in 2001, we published the methodology styled as evolving methodology and our emphasis was on skin marking the trajectory to the foramen, visualization of the basic pathology of the annular tear which caused the pain in discogenic origin and sciatica. In 2002, Young and Sau talked about the transforaminal endoscopy technique with various specialized instruments to treat all forms of disc herniation by transforaminal approach. This technique is performed in local anesthesia and use of lidocaine 0.5 or 1% permits the generous use for pain control, but a patient is able to feel the pain when the inflamed nerve root is manipulated. Now, how this has and not changed the world? The aware state endoscopic surgery has demonstrated pathology which was not un, which was not seen and therefore not appreciated. And we know now that all possible pain generators are accessible by postulateral transforaminal approach. With the advent of MRI, and in vivo visualization of the pathoanatomy, we are now able to see which are the pain generators and all the pathology which was not seen before. And in the old days, traditionally, there used to be a very popular concept of area below the pedicle called as hidden zone of McNabb. In fact, we are now working in the hidden zone and the hidden zone is no more hidden from our eyes and from our scope. We strongly believe that what our mind doesn't know, our eyes don't see. So, with our increased understanding and mental ability to visualize these structures, our approach to the problem has changed. There have been increasing new developments where we are tackling the stenotic symptoms and we do that. <coughs> these stenotic symptoms can come up after discectomy if the foramen is not cleared of the tissue. We can do root mobilization. There are extended indications of the surgery and it includes everything except the instabilities. We also have the interlaminar approach, new technology and gadgets are coming from for annular closure and reinforcement. Then we have a upper foraminal access to the central canal 
We can also do the trans facet surgery and use of biologicals is now slowly becoming very common. Disc regeneration by biological, mechanical and chemical means is also a reality now. So, Cambin emphasized decompression of the epidural space indirectly and avoiding the epidural space in order to spare the vessels and the nerves and therefore by avoiding the scarring. It further evolved into now a direct epidural access. There was also a variation which was proposed and popularized by Thomas Hoogland as outside in access by the thesis technique. And there was a variation in the trajectory and the angle of access which was proposed by Hoogland, Rutten and Choi and where they directly hit the inferior or the superior migrated fragments by cutting the facet. This targeted entry which can vary from extreme lateral from midline to a moderate 35 to 45 degree angle is directed to traverse the foramen towards the osteophyte or the disc directly. So, it is by cutting the facet that you gain an entry to the epidural space and this is called the outside in access. Now, outside in procedure is partly blind, it is dependent on serial dilatation to retract the nerves. It usually involves the foraminoplasty with trephines and dreamers as well as discectomy. This approach is better understood by the traditional surgeons by using dilatation technique for MI surgery, but it ignores the anomalous anatomy of the purple nerves, the sympathetic nerves and other anomalous nerves documented and described by us in our publication recently. There are complications and adverse risks of dysesthesia are higher by doing the outside in approach. Rutten has described the intranamanal axis with the same instruments mainly for L5S1 because L5S1 is where the intralaminar window is very big. We have to also remember that outside in approach is applicable only to L45 and L5S1 mainly because the lamina is very wide and there is an overhang of the facets or the superior articular process over the disc. Therefore, it may be very valid at those stages or those levels. In the upper lumbar uh, spine, the outside in approach has no relevance at all. 2001 was our first publication on evolving methodology of the spine endoscopy for back and leg pain and there we have emphasized the importance of annular tear. We have evolved from those days into understanding more and more of the pain generation and now we are able to target the pain in an awake and aware patient under local anesthesia. Now coming to a few points, how surgeons perceive the minimally invasive spine surgery from a paper in 2008 which was published in uh, this journal of uh, Spine Arthroplasty Society in 2008. Now what it is saying is over a period of time, a very large proportion of people are doing more and more MI surgery as compared to a little or partly MI surgery in the past. And if we look at the perceived limitations by the experience and the new MI surgeons, in case of experienced surgeons, the matters of concern are technical difficulty, too much radiation because we work under the CM, lack of training opportunities, previous negative experience, too expensive because of use of excess technology, lack of proven efficacy, lack of patient demand, risk of litigation, etc., and poor training techniques. For the new MIS surgeons, it is mainly the lack of training opportunity, technical difficulty, too much radiation, etc. So, for the new surgeon, it is the lack of training opportunity which I am trying to cover by these online courses. So, history of traditional transfermental endoscopy is the truly minimally invasive technique, really, is 1963 where Lyman Smith injected amopapain in the disc. And he is the one who started International Intradiscal Therapy and Surgery Society. 84 was non specific depressurization by laser. 85 was automatic discectomy. Pure intradiscal decompression surgery, more effective, faster results as compared to waiting for natural non surgical resolution of pain condition has now been validated. Now, if there is a natural resolution, it is what we treat by non-operative care. If the natural resolution fails, then we think of surgery of our variety. In 1988, Cambin and Samson described the purely endoscopic technique and then there was a 
limitation on the indication in the form of only contained herniation or non sequestrated intracanal distal hernia. This evolved with time, including translaminar dorsal access surgery, simultaneous use of arthroscope to access cannula. That is, Cambin started doing a posterior midline surgery and using a cannula and a scope through the foramen and combined both, which then slowly shifted from posterior midline surgery to entirely a transforaminal surgery. The foramenal approach around 1996 by Matthews, extending intracanal therapy to decompressing the foramen through the scope, and he actually developed a fiber optic endoscope, Hal Matthews, for sofa mesmanic. Young Cambin, before Matthews' publication, had already begun to use working channel scope by Smith and Nephew, exploring the epidural space. But only the Yes scope 1998 came to be commercialized by Richard Wolf. 1990s, people switched from open discectomy with the naked eye to microscope assisted discectomy. Microscope was used to magnify and visualize the target, and micro discectomy or micro lumbar discectomy became the standard in those days. Nowadays, it is no more a standard because we have evolved further. Endoscope assisted surgery, as per Kevin Foley or Jean de Strandu came into 1995, where the same old interlaminar surgery was done through the use of tubes and scopes. And the scope took the eye to the target and improved the visualization and lighting. Now, in all these developments, the understanding and the philosophy did not change. And with respect to traditional goals, only mechanical decompression is done. Historically, Destrandu preceded Kevin Foley, even though Foley published his results first. So, this was early part of endoscopy, if you want to include this as a form of minimally invasive spine surgery. Now, Kuslidge has to be given the credit to truly help us in directing our attention to the fundamental question, that is, where is the pain coming from and understanding of tissue origin, the concept of pain generators, pain patterns. And then also fundamentally, he made the surgery possible under local anesthesia as significant pain is not seen in paraspinal structures in the transforaminal axis. In 1995, as we have mentioned before, a study by Markovich and his president, Dr. David Schrad, highlighting the maximum size of cannula which can go in the foramen for transforaminal axis really changed the whole concept of doing the surgery after 1995. Late 90s, as we already mentioned, Siebert, Loy, Casper, Martin Knight were the uh, main personalities in minimally invasive surgery. Martin Knight was one of the first ones to use laser for foraminal decompression for lateral and subarticular stenosis. And he was the one who proposed mobilization of the root, and he was very effective in his hands. He used to be most effective for failed back surgery, where he was able to cover most of the patients by use of his smaller scope called as KESS or the night system. Now, Young integrated this inside out surgery and surgery for the foramen stenosis using the combination of laser, prefines, keresons, burrs, etc., through a working channel endoscope. Now, the patient is under local anesthetic, he is comfortable during the entire procedure with the exception of periods of. Uh, discography and annular fenestration, the patient is absolutely comfortable and the instruments when they are manipulated next to the nerve, the patient may have some pain. Why we are talking about minimally invasive spine surgery and not only access? Surgical management of back and leg pain is evolving. We have a better understanding of pathoanatomy. Pain is better understood with in vivo visualization of the pathology and probing of the pain generators. And rather than symptoms, diagram, and image correlation with the narration inputs, we are actually seeing the pathology and talking with the patient during our surgery. We can have a shared decision making where the patient is involved in the decision making. We can focus on a broader spectrum of surgical as well as non surgical treatments not just masking the pain generators, but relieving the pain totally. And decision based on diagnostic images, as we know, have fallacies. Image alterations cannot explain the pain experienced by the individual. And images do not always show the variations in the nerve supply and the pathoanatomy. So this was a new understanding which we had when we started doing our surgery under local anesthesia. 
The ability to isolate and visualize the pain generators in the foramen also led to the concept of hybrid surgery, which Dr. Gore, that is myself and Dr. Narkani have proposed and have successfully uh, been doing this surgery. Treating persistent pain by visualizing inflammation and compression of the nerve was possible. A better pre-surgical planning with more specific and defined goals in mind is possible. Inside out philosophy is very safe. It provides a basic access to the disc and foramen and we can cover a large spectrum of painful pathologies. So in short to summarize we have come from the stage of central debulking to a targeted fragmentectomy to a stage where now we are able to cover almost all possible manifestations including the instability which is covered under hybrid surgery where we do a foraminal decompression and a percutaneous stabilization and we go on to use a cage through the working channel and stabilize the spine anteriorly in the body by using the cage. In short, our transforaminal access or the basics of minimally invasive surgery have stood the test of time and have been helping various surgeons and their patients in overcoming the problems of pain and disability. You can come up, you can take this up, you can understand how we have evolved and take this further for the benefit of your patients. Thank you very much.